Hello and welcome back to the Spike podcast. I'm Fraser Myers and with me this week as ever we have Spike's editor Tom Slater. Hello. And we're delighted to be joined by writer and broadcaster Candice Holdsworth. Hello. Coming up on today's show, the global populist revival, how the Israel-Hamas war is sending the West mad and the women fighting back for women's sports. So there's been two huge political earthquakes uh, across the world. Two very different men um, have shocked, uh, have enjoyed shock victories. Firstly, we had last, just the end of last week, we had Javier Millet in Argentina, uh, the sort of anarcho-capitalist libertarian type uh, winning uh, unexpectedly. And then an even bigger shock in the Netherlands, Heert Wilders, the anti-Islam populist, uh, shocked everyone, came from nowhere seemingly to uh, win quite convincingly in the Dutch elections. Tom, these are two very different people um, with, from very different political backgrounds. So shall we talk a bit about Herr Wilders first? What do you think that represents in, in Europe? Um, I think it's a blow to liberal centrist complacency as much as anything else. I thought it was really interesting looking at some of the coverage going into the election, which is basically treating it as a done deal that Wilders wasn't really going to trouble the sort of top of the table. There mm. was this amazing piece in the BBC, I think, the day before the election, which was saying this is going to be a really interesting moment because the centre-right party has a, has a female leader and there's this new centrist upstart party which could also do quite well, buried in the piece as any mention of Wilders and the Freedom Party. So I think it was an interesting example of that. And th this has been a recurring feature of a lot of the com commentary on um, politics in the Netherlands as far as sort of suggesting that unlike Britain or unlike France or unlike Italy, it's a very sensible country. They don't do populism yeah. there. We've, people used to say that about Britain before Brexit incidentally. Uh, and it's just blown all of those very lazy assumptions completely out of the water. I think what's been interesting in the Netherlands context is that there have been various different kind of populist movements and parties who have been vying for that particular position in recent years. Um, and it seems like partly because of the failures of some of those parties to capitalise on original um, gains that they had been making, that people have kind of reverted back to Wilders, who's been this kind of mainstay of um, mm. politics there for some time. But um, it just shows that the uh, the populist wave isn't going anywhere. It's become a kind of established feature of European politics, really, and a kind of established poll. And while it's not to say that um, Wilders himself is a positive um, outlet for that anger with the establishment, the anger is very real. It's very there. It's very up for the taking and shaping, if you like. And it just amazes me that people didn't see it coming, yeah. given the fact that, it's, as I say, it was um, you didn't need to be some sort of genius to recognise that that anger with the establishment hadn't gone away in the Netherlands or anywhere else. You know. Yeah, Candice, what do you make of that kind of complacency? It feels as if every time there's an election anywhere in Europe where a populist doesn't um, storm to victory, that populism is declared dead, that all everyone's problems are over, You know, people don't have any aspirations for change anymore, and liberal centrism is brilliant and uh you know on the march and taking care of things yes yeah it's so true i mean holland in particular was always sort of portrayed as just the absolute antithesis of brexit britain you know, they're very calm they're very moderate they're very outward looking everyone there speaks about three languages they're nothing like us and when they saw what a disaster brexit was they would never go anything near it and then you see something like this happen I mean, he hasn't won an outright victory. I mean, he's going to have to form a coalition with yeah. someone. So, I mean, it is quite a fragmented political landscape, which I think is quite typical. That's happening all over the world. Even with um, the British election next year, that's also predicted that it could possibly be a hung parliament. So we're seeing a lot of political fracturing all over the world. And I think it's so true. There has been, like Tom says, a lot of complacency, which is why people are suddenly shocked. Oh, my goodness. How did Kiet Wilders go from, like, nothing to suddenly winning the most seats? And you think, well, actually, you know, there must have been something. It hasn't gone from some like nothing to something. There's a great deal that's happened in between there, but people have failed to grasp it or not taken it seriously enough. That that volatility really is key to understanding mm -hmm. this, isn't it, Tom? I mean, it's like the any loyalties that people might have had to older parties in pretty much every context and every election you look to, that, that seems to have completely crumbled away. And so, you know, things are there for the taking mm -hmm. um, and often it's a completely different party uh, in one election to another. Mm -hmm. And of course, you see that more accelerated in countries like the Netherlands, where you have um, a more proportional system. And therefore, all of these different parties, this kind of long list of people who can kind of vie for the candidacy. And I think it has been really interesting watching the kind of populist offerings sort of wax and wane over there in recent years. Mm -hmm. You worry about it in your piece on Spike this week about um, there, was a, there was a period in which the Forum of 
Forum for Democracy, which was this sort of right populist outfit, um, was seemingly making a lot of waves as a few years ago. They've gone down a kind of conspiratorial <laughs> rabbit hole in recent years, which has made builders look sensible by comparison. Uh, you had the Farmers' Revolt, of course, mm -hmm. um, which produced or at least fueled the rise of the BBB, this farmer citizen movement, which um, topped the provincial elections. Yeah. And um, looked like it was really spoiling to do something interesting at these elections. And um, that's kind of run aground, partly not least, I think, because its leader has sort of openly said, I don't want to be prime minister because I don't like flying, which I think uh, <laughs> didn't necessarily <laughs> add to that sense of momentum. Um, but as you say, there is that volatility. But also there's it's um, it's just quite clear that this is here to stay. And um, saying that does not and welcoming that doesn't mean that we necessarily are pleased about the particular parties or individuals who have been capitalizing yeah. on that i mean yes. Vilders and the freedom party the freedom party is the worst named political party in history so once you get onto the dutch trading standards they want mm. to you know <laughs> uh clam down on mosques ban the quran and so on it's been a very liberal but also prejudicial campaign that he's been waging yeah. there even whilst we should recognize that he's obviously responding as yeah. many other right populists are to the inability of the center or the left to talk about issues around migration and islamism and so on but it's just quite clearly um, that this desire to hit back at the establishment is there. I think the question of people who want to change politics rather than just revert back to the sort of centrist technocratic mean is to find a way of speaking to that, of cultivating that. But it seems like, uh, unfortunately, the tragedy is that it's just the right populists of very different hues who, who are willing to go there, who yeah. are willing to grubby themselves by having to deal with ordinary people and what they actually might want. So I think there's a lesson for that, certainly, but it's not one that I think the elites are going to heed any time soon. I think also, you know, one of the takeaways from this election, um, it, I mean, it's a confirmation of a trend we've already seen, I guess, is that green politics is really one of the big fault lines emerging in Europe right now. Um, the person who uh, came second, Franz Timmermans, uh, was beaten quite convincingly by Wilders, was vice president of the European Commission, and he was in charge of, or the face of, essentially, uh, the European green deal which is responsible for so many of the kind of stringent climate measures that the farmers that we were talking about earlier have been out in uh, out protesting against clearly um voters are not going to tolerate having their living standards slashed even if it's sort of hidden behind this sort of net zero mumbo jumbo i mean so it's not just about immigration there are these other issues that are asserting themselves Wilders also was talking a lot about the eu he wants it in out referendum so it's it's bigger than uh, any one issue. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a sort of false consensus that everyone's happy about the green policies, everyone's happy about the EU, and that has punctured a big hole in us. Yeah. And I think you're right. Like it, what you're both saying as well is so right. You know, this Kietfeld isn't necessarily a good outlet for all this. You know, it's such a pity that there isn't someone who can represent these views in what I think is a much better way. But I think it's because there is this false consensus, because there is no real debate around these issues, because people who try and talk about them are often demonized, you will find that, yes, it's those on the fringes who are willing to deal with it. Like you say, the, the sort of the grubby work, it seems mm -hmm. the grubby work of dealing with what ordinary people want. I think when you have a more open debate, a more open culture, these things are freely discussed. In my experience, it naturally moderates. Yeah. And then you get just ordinary people just being able to address these issues instead of people saying mad things. And, and Tom, let's uh, move on to talk a bit about uh, Javier Millet. It's kind of um, almost like appears a bit of a rock star type. He likes to go around with his chainsaw yeah. and he wants to take an axe to the state. This is a very different um, approach to um, attacking the establishment as we've seen in Europe. Mm -hmm. and, that, and he's a very colourful character, <laughs> to, to say the least. Um, he seems almost in the kind of Berlusconi mould as someone who was a kind of pundit slash economist mm -hmm. who, um, and very colourful character who's kind of then turned that into a kind of viable political <laughs> movement. Um, incidentally, I think he's been a Rolling Stones tribute act yeah, um, and has a bunch of dogs which are all named after right-wing economists. So it tells you something about the sort of character that we're dealing with here. He's unlike some of the um, other populist challenges that I think we've seen in recent years because which have often even when in right wing form have often reacted against um sort of global corporate capitalism in one form or another they might just hint at it sometimes as sort of Trump would um or have taken it a bit more seriously in the cases of some other right populist this is very much in the kind of as you say sort of anarcho-capitalist mode um and also if given these movements tend to care about national sovereignty given he wants to dollarize the Argentine economy yeah. <laughs> doesn't seem like a particularly good route to that but one thing it does capture is the fact that um and one thing that is certainly um of a piece with some of the other 
revolts that we've seen in recent years, is that sense that you've got an establishment in this case, the kind of Peronist establishment, which had not only uh, run out of road, but completely failed the people. You had triple yeah. digit inflation there, something like four in 10 Argentinians were living below the poverty line. You can understand in that context why they would want to take a chance on a wild card. What do they have to lose at this point? So whilst I don't think that economically speaking necessarily has the answers, and whilst I think politically speaking, um, in terms of populism's very positive content, in terms of really pushing democracy forward, um, that remains to be seen, not least because kind of radical anarchists slash libertarians tend not to care about democracy <laughs> particularly. Uh, I think it's of a piece in the sense that you do have a people who've been failed by a mm by a quite monocultural political establishment who all basically agree with each other even if they have got slightly different parties and slightly yeah. different types of policies um, and a wild card who people have decided to take a chance on because they've got nothing else to lose and I think that's definitely part of the picture definitely yeah. and, and Candice before we move on I mean what do you make of the way that the sort of knee jerk reaction in the west in our media is just to say oh he's far right that's kind of all it amounts to yeah. he's far right the people are crazy voting in a fascist what's wrong with them i know and they're both i mean they're quite different people i mean malay and wilders I mean, come from quite different intellectual traditions i mean but everyone's just lumped together as far right and i think also you know argentina it is its own experience it has had its own history and its own experience you know they've defaulted on their debt numerous times i mean they went from being one of the most prosperous economies in the world to now one of the biggest basket cases economically. I mean, they absolutely, I think people are ready to try something really different. I mean, they went through years of the Perons and I mean, it's just been a disaster for them. So I think, yes, we kind of tend to look at them all as one thing, you know, Malay and Wilders and Georgia Maloney, but but I think each, you know, each country is different and there are different drivers. Um, and just to say that it's some fascist, absolutely not. We're looking for a full-time advertising sales executive so if you've got a bit of experience in media sales and securing new brand partners, if you're commercially minded and you're driven by making sales, and if you're passionate about promoting Spike's journalism, then this could be the job for you. To find out more, just go to spiked-online.com forward slash jobs. That's spiked-online.com forward slash jobs. So the Israel-Hamas war is still having some very strange uh, repercussions in the West. Tom, you wrote about this this week. I mean, one of the strangest developments has been on TikTok, where Osama bin Laden seems to have had a kind of viral recovery. People um, discovering his letter to America, mm. his justification for um, attacking the Twin Towers, and finding a revelation in it. They seem to almost agree with it, bizarrely. Yeah, it's become like a sort of Generation Z pin-up, apparently. Yeah. You know, like move over Greta Thunberg and Harry Styles, the new kid on the block. Um, yes, this is a very strange phenomenon. It sort of kicked off last week um, and whereby people began to notice that on TikTok in particular, this has started to produce a bunch of videos and a bunch of conversation. There was at least kind of two million views on the hashtag for Letter to America, which of course was this um, screed, this piece of propaganda attributed to Osama bin Laden that was published about a year after 9-11, essentially trying to explain why he was in, engaged in holy war against the West. Um, and obviously, given the current conflict, it also has a lot to say about Israel. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, America's support for Israel in the Letters to America is basically presented almost as the original sin as to why America is game, fair game to be attacked, full of anti-Semitic anti conspiracy theories as well about Jews controlling world affairs and so on. Um, you look at the videos in particular that first of all they're, they're a little bit um, cautious about what it is that they're supposedly finding so revelatory yeah. um, but saying things like we've been lied to our entire lives I'm having a um, existential crisis as a <laughs> consequence of reading this um, it's important not to suggest that you know America's woke 20 something so a few videos away from becoming jihadists or something um, it's fair to say that the hashtag exploded much more beyond that 2 million views as soon as mainstream journalists started yeah. covering it and everyone went over there to kind of gawp at it as it were um, and since then TikTok have clamped down on it but at the same time I don't think um, you can dismiss it and also I think there's clearly a sort of chiming between that sort of Islamist terrorist jihadist <laughs> mindset and what a lot of these woke youngsters have been brought up on yeah it's not to draw a direct continuum for them but this is something that um, we've seen develop over some time. So that there is a kind of conversation, a kind of parasitical relationship between kind of woke leftism 
and jihadism and Islamism. There has been for some time. They draw on a quite a kind of anti-Western attitude, the idea that the, the West is the, basically the root of all evils. Um, they also draw, particularly as we've seen in recent weeks, on a deep Israelophobia to outright anti-Semitism, which has become yeah. quite core to both sides. I think they're, they're kind of drawing from the same well to a certain extent. And this is actually something that historically Bin Laden and more of the kind of Western-focused propagandists within Al-Qaeda would seek to exploit. They would seek to exploit kind of notes of racial identity politics mm. or they would seek to exploit a kind of Western self-loathing mm. in order to try to curry favour against certain kind of useful idiots, usually amongst the supposedly anti-imperialist Western left. So this, as a kind of parasitical relationship, has existed for some time. And I think yeah. this is just one of the more ridiculous, uh, easily mockable manifestations of that in terms of these Generation Z woke influences suddenly latching onto this text and thinking that it's got a lot to say to them in the here and now. I mean, Candice, I mean, has it really just got to the point where people will latch on to anything that is vaguely anti-West, that it could literally, it could be Hamas, it could be Bin Laden, and suddenly that seems sympathetic because it's against us, because it's against the imperial America or against the imp allegedly imperialist Israel? Yes. I mean, what, what I found interesting about that whole TikTok phenomenon was how performative it was. Yeah. So the first person who posted it, she was like, oh, it blew my mind. <laughs> and then afterwards, there were loads of videos of people saying the same thing. Mm. My mind is blown. And cynical me was like, have you even read it? <laughs> and I wondered if they'd even read it or if they were just performing a role on TikTok. I mean, I just didn't know. I couldn't tell. But I think it's true. I think you know, there was a whole truther movement after 9-11, which mm. you guys will remember that, you know, it didn't even happen, that it was a false flag operation. But I think this sentiment that's being uh, expressed now, this actual sympathy with bin Laden, that is something new. And that is this new sort of anti-Western. He, he was um, seen, as a, he's seen as a liberation figure. Mm. He's someone who's striking back against the West, against colonialism. And that is something that's very specific to the age we live in. And it comes Absolutely out of identity politics. Yeah. I mean, it, and this sort of thing has existed, but on the fringes, but now it's sort of, it's in the education system and it's sort of seen as a respectable viewpoint. What I found frightening though, is if they did actually read the letter, and I'm not convinced that all of them did, is there was blatant anti-Semitism in yeah. there that most of us would just think was red flag instantly. But for them, it wasn't. It's homophobia as well. You know, given yeah. a lot of these seem like the kind of queers for Palestine sort of community in terms of people <laughs> making these videos, you know, outright, you know, the part of the reason America is right to be attacked is because of its um, fornication, homosexuality and gambling. Was mm. He wasn't too keen on. So, yeah, there's a, a bizarre alliance, certainly. So it's too quick. <laughs> and, hey, Handis, you, you wrote um, very well for us earlier this week about the strange, not quite alliance, but the almost blind eye that lots of so-called intersectional feminists yes. have been turning to Hamas particularly the sort of mass rape of women. So, I mean, do you want to say something about that? That has been truly shocking. And I see quite a few people have started speaking about this now. It really is very striking. I mean, women's groups, who you would think would be the people who would denounce this the most, have gone very quiet, or they've denied it, or they've attempted to contextualize it. Yeah. I mean, Sisters Uncut, who we know to be this very radical feminist group, they haven't said a word about it. Not a word. I mean, they've organized a lot of these pro-Palestine marches, and that's their right. They can do that. But they haven't they haven't once condemned what happened. In fact, they've even said that it may even be just a form of resistance. Yeah, or, or that it's racist to say that this is specifically, you know, they say an Arab problem, whatever, when people are trying to uh, t tell them, that, look, Hamas did this thing. I know. They said, you know, you shouldn't weaponize <laughs> rape to the ends of Islamophobia. But then you don't get to call yourself a feminist. I'm sorry. Once you have legitimized that, you are not a feminist. It is unprincipled feminism. And it is. It is because they have a deep, deep, deep bias against Israel to, to the point where any sort of violence against the Israelis is... It, I don't know if they condone it, but they ignore it mm. or they try and contextualize it. Um, and it's very, very, very disturbing because the, the experiences of those women have just been completely erased. And Tom, another thing that people have tried to ignore, contextualise, deny, has been the evidence that's been emerging from the Al-Shifa hospital. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for a long time, people have known that that's a Hamas base of some description. Don't know how, we haven't known how significant it is, but mm -hmm. people have tried to pretend that this isn't the case, even as weapons have been found, even as 
tunnel networks have been found. I mean, what have you made of that? I, f- I found it really dispiriting and strange. I mean, not least because, as you suggest, there's always been this understanding that to what extent is unclear, but the fact yeah. that this hospital was being used by Hamas for, shall we say, non-medical purposes. I mean, there was a Amnesty International report back in 2014, I believe, mm-hmm. which was talking about it being used as a centre for interrogations and torture. Um, there have been cases going back even before that where you had um, medics within the hospital being uh, expressing concerns and even going on strike over it being used by Hamas, again, as for political purposes, often to harass and go after people who were pro fatah And so this is a kind of open secret and obviously you had um the israelis constantly putting out various pieces of information over the course of the past week um trying to substantiate why this was a target not in the sense that they wanted to level it to the ground but why they needed to get in there to um try and find hamas and try and find hamas fighters and nothing seemed to work so there was that shocking video release of hamas um fighters running into the hospital on Mm. october 7th with some of the hostages which they'd just stolen from southern israel and yet this video, which seems to put them so bang to rights, you know, they're openly using this as kind of part of their operations. You now you had Owen Jones musing about how, well, that's what, they took the hostages to hospital and that's a reason oh to God. make this a sort Help of legitimate... Yes. when they're injured, yes. yeah. The only um, justification or um, rationalisation for that kind of response is that he's trolling. Nothing else makes any mm-hmm. sense. And then you saw this as well when suddenly videos were released and information was released about the tunnels that had been yeah. discovered on the general kind of, uh, you know, the, the land, um, the, the the compound in which it was taken. And again, people were just sort of dismissing it as, yeah. well, you know. And then, of course, there was that... Hospitals have basements, don't they? Hospitals, yeah. hospitals have basements, don't they? And this was slightly before um, some of the evidence that I've just been talking about came out. But you had Jeremy Bowen on the BBC when the kind of first haul of Kalashnikovs and suicide vests had been found he was like well if you spend time in hospitals in the middle of the east that stuff is just tends to be there you know and this stretches credibility to such an extreme degree and it has just gotten to the point where of course fog of war mm. one needs to be skeptical about claims on all sides i get that yeah. that's not what this is no. this is outright cynicism which in some cases seems to play into a kind of well of course they are lying aren't they mm. yeah um and whilst one wants to be careful about how, well, about the accusations one flings, you cannot help but conclude from the media discussion, particularly on kind of left wing Twitter, about the hospital and the evidence emanating from it, um, that what we're dealing with here is not just scepticism, it's a kind of grim, knee jerk, of course they're lying prejudice. Yeah. Um, which has been, yeah, pretty hard to um to take to be honest yes i completely agree i think it's gone beyond healthy skepticism i mean obviously as journalists especially when you're dealing with war and conflict you have to try and verify everything you know make sure that what you're looking at is genuine but i mean when you are explaining away someone being dog marched into a hospital being dragged with someone who has a meat cleaver in their hand and you're saying no, they're just being taken for medical treatment. Yeah. I mean, that is going way beyond it, yeah. way beyond it. But I think that this is just of a piece, you know. I mean, I think people just have these deep, deep, deep biases. And I think in any way questioning them, I think it makes them even wonder if they're moral, that they're not on the good side. Mm. You know, I mean, if Hamas can do these things, well, then maybe what I've been supporting is evil. And I I don't support evil things. And I wonder if that's something that's going on there. Yeah. Right, and finally, let's talk about the fight back for women's sports. So there's been, across the sporting world, really, um, lots of difference as women's groups have been refusing to play, been boycotting certain sports and competitions where men have been allowed under so-called trans inclusion rules. Now, probably most notably uh, in the past week or so, there's been lots of uh, four teams in Sheffield have decided to boycott their league because... A transgender player who essentially meted out a career or not career ending or season ending injury um, has been allowed to play. And Candice, what have you made about this? Surely it's about time that people boycotted this. I think, yes, absolutely. I think it's the only option women have left now. I mean, you can't rely on these institutional bodies to be sensible Hmm. and to actually just implement fair policies that I think most people would agree are totally reasonable. I think it's individual sportswomen are just going to have to say, no, I will not compete against a man in a competition where he could hit me in the face and injure me. I'm not doing it. But I do find it um, sad, though, that they have to do this, that they're 
being forced to take these positions. I can't believe we've got to this point. And I just hope that now, like these sporting bodies will start paying attention and stop forcing women to do this and stop forcing women into the position where they feel they have to choose between what they've worked for their entire lives. Yeah. And this just bizarre idea that men can suddenly magically become women is ridiculous. Tom, I mean, a lot of the conversation about women's sports is centered around fairness, which is understandable, you know, the uh, inherent uh, strength of being a man versus being a woman. But we've also seen a lot of cases where sort of safety is coming into play, into play not mm. just um, this example of a woman who's injured by a trans footballer, but also, you know, they've been allowing men to compete in women's boxing matches mm. and things like that. It just seems to beg a belief almost. That, that was another one of the boycotts of recent weeks. You've um, had um, women boxers pull out of bouts against um, men, against biological males. And that was actually one of the earliest, funny enough, um, sort of trans sport controversies that really went viral in relation to contact sports because it was the Fallon Fox controversy. Yeah, it was an MMA. MMA, MMA fighter. You know? Yeah. <laughs> the kind of no holes barred, you know, fighting um, competitions um, where you had essentially a situation where in the name of progress and inclusion and being a good person, you were supposed to applaud a man punching a woman in the face. This is ridiculous. And that's, the, I really think this is where most people get off, you know, <laughs> in terms of the, 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 um, the supposed inclusivity train. You know, mm. if you're in a situation in which um, you're supposed to applaud this kind of thing, ignore the questions, not just of fairness, as you say, but just sort of basic safety, it's the point in which, you know, the rubber really hits the road. <laughs> and I think um, it's something that it's interesting that it's happening in grassroots sports as well as just the kind of top level the level of the commentary and so on i think that's a very welcome development because no one benefits from going down this particular road and as many very courageous campaigners in this space have made clear if you allow this faux inclusion to become the kind of guiding principle of sports women's sports as it currently exists will cease to will cease to exist i mean it would just it would completely blow so many kind of female competitors who've been working their entire lives out of the water. There have been so many cases already of people deprived their place on the podium or deprived their gold medal because of the fact that an individual who was notedly average when competing in the male category suddenly, suddenly jumps into the female categories and is breaking records left, right and centre. It is obvious to anyone that this cannot go on. And we're starting to see that. And the question is, how long will it take for that to be accepted because it's, it's taken quite a while for athletics and swimming and cycling to change their policies on this. I think the FA are now kind of the gears are slowly grinding about yeah. how they're going to try and respond, but um, it can't come soon enough. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. And I remember Fallon Fox won, I mean, in brutal knockouts, but then in the final lost to a very skilled fighter because actually Fallon Fox was not that skilled, had just he had basically been able to rely on his superior strength. And when he actually came up against someone who was really good at what they did, he lost. But it just goes to show, you know, I mean, women who are brilliant at these at these sports will suddenly just get usurped by someone who can just come in with superior strength, and it's wrong. Yeah, and it seems, um, and Candice, you're quite rightly using the what I'd say the correct pronouns. <laughs> yeah. But a lot of this does seem to be, a lot of the confusion just seems to stem from the language that we use, I think. You know, yeah. if if you say quite bluntly, should a man be allowed to in a boxing ring with a woman? People yeah. would say no. But when you say should a transgender woman be allowed, you know that that creates confusion. No, uh, you know there's all these debates over you know how much testosterone or yeah. what some relevant should have, which yeah. is relevant. Whether they should have gone through male puberty or not, all these things. When if you were just straightforward with your language and were able to say this is a man, this is a woman, then we wouldn't be having these ridiculous arguments. Exactly. I mean, I, totally. I think the only one that really confuses me is poor old Casta Semenya, mm. who has only ever been raised as a woman and only ever knows herself to be a woman. But it's so true. You know, we should be able to um, speak clearly about sex. And I can't believe we've arrived at this situation where we can't do that. And we have to sort of, and it's, it, and we create our reality through language. Yeah. So if we can't say that is a man, we start you know, qualifying it and calling it a transgender woman, then we confuse ourselves about the reality of the situation. Thank you so much for watching the Spikes podcast. We'll be back next Friday. If you hit subscribe and click the bell, you'll never miss an episode. And in the meantime, why not check out all of Spikes' other videos and podcasts on this channel? 
And for more Spiked content, find us at spiked-online.com.